Hi, I'm Valerie Koo, and today I'm talking to E. Lockhart, who is the author of Family of Liars. Now, this is the prequel to the global phenomenon that was We Were Liars, which actually came out a few years ago and did, you know, fairly well, but then went bonkers during the pandemic thanks to TikTok or Book Talk, where heaps of people around the world started posting about that book, We Were Liars. The sales went through the roof and people started demanding more from E. Lockhart. And so this is the prequel. We chat about her writing journey, her other books, and how she has made the most of her popularity on TikTok. Thank you so much for joining us today, Emily. Yeah, glad to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you about your latest book, Family of Liars. It's I'm gonna I already know it's going to be a sensation. Just in case readers haven't got a copy of their own yet, can you tell us what it's about? Sure. Family of Liars is set on a private island off the coast of Massachusetts, and it's the story of a young woman who's the eldest of a number of sisters in a family that spends every summer on this island. And when Carrie is 17, um, their lives are kind of upended for the summer by the arrival of a literal boatload of attractive young men. <laughs> um, it's a romantic story, but it is not a romance. I would call it a thriller. It's kind of a story about the dark, uh, side of human nature and an exploration of um you know what we're capable of at our worst and forgiveness and um how to move on from things that one might do that are terrible <laughs> yes. which is you know it's very similar in its thematic content to my novel we were liars which is um set uh 27 years later. So this novel takes place um, with a whole different generation of the Sinclair family that you saw in We Were Liars. And mm -hmm. so you get to see um, and uncover a whole lot of family secrets that are not revealed in that first book. Mm. So We Were Liars became a publishing sensation. And when you wrote it, did you know at that time that you were going to write a prequel at some point? No, I didn't know at all. Um, we Were Liars came out in the US in 2014, and I think at the same time in Australia. And it was nicely popular. I was really happy to have so many readers. I felt really lucky um, that it found its readers. And then, then it was kind of done the way books are, right? After a year or two, after the paperback is out and all that, it quiets down. And it quieted down and I went on and wrote other books. And um, then what happened was basically I got this wonderful surge of new readers um, starting in around mid 2020. And the reason was that people were making videos on TikTok about this novel in particular. Mm. And I just had the wonderful luck that a couple really great TikTok creators with smart ways of, of conveying their feelings about books happened to make videos about, about my novel. And so sales went way up and have stayed up, you know, for 18, 20 months. And um, during that period, uh, a lot of people were asking me if I wanted to write a sequel. And if you've mm. read We Were Liars, you <laughs> can tell that a sequel might not be such a good idea. Um, <laughs> I could not figure out how to write a sequel that anybody would be happy to read that would deliver the same kind of thrill or, and experience um, that the first book did. And so it really took me a while to figure out what I could write that would be satisfying, that I thought mm. I could do a good job with, that was worth spending a year of my time on um, and that would be worth other people reading. And I finally did um, come up with an idea that, that I wanted to do. Um, mm. but you know, if you'd asked me, you know, when, when we were liars first came out, I would have said no way. Mm. So if you, you know, had not thought, oh, I'll, if I'll write a prequel one day, did you though already have the backstory 
of some of the characters. No. So no. Wow. I made it all up fresh. Wow. Okay. So just for people who may not have read We Are Liars or some of your other books, what age do you or, or what life stage do you think your you focus on in terms of your readers? Well, my books are all published as young adult novels. And um, my actual readers range from 11 to 92. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of uh, adult readers, maybe more yes. than a typical YA writer. I think that's partly because my books tend to be good for book club discussion. Yeah. They're very, you know, there's the, lend themselves to a certain amount of arguing and unpacking and mm. um and other than that I don't really know why but I I know who comes to my events and I know, yes. you know who I'm seeing um talk about the books online and so forth and it and there's yeah a, a pretty nice number of adults um, yeah. But I'm writing with that teenage reader in mind and yes. then anyone else who comes to the table is welcome to join us. Yes. So you, you these books are published as young adult novels, but, um, for example, I am the same age as the main character. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of the, you know, the references, the music, the um, movies, the people that the character loves as a teenager are things I completely relate to. So I think it's really clever how layered it is because um, as, you know, people my age, decades older than young adult, read it and enjoy it and resonate with it and connect with it because it's also a little bit nostalgic, but you can relate to the universal themes, right? Did you layer in those things on purpose? <laughs> You're probably going to say, nah, that was just. <laughs> well, I mean, the book was set in 1987. Um, and so, yeah, I, I did spend some time with the food in particular. Um, so the Sinclairs are cooking, you know, they're all on this private island and they're making, you know, they're having little parties and they're cooking out and things like that. And um, I did a bunch of research about food in the 80s and uh <laughs> things that were trendy you know everybody was really excited about pesto and sun-dried tomatoes and um you know uh, there were some things like that uh that were really fun to layer in um and there's music that's definitely layered in that's the music that teenagers were listening to at that time a certain demographic of teenagers um but The story is told very much, even though there's a little frame story where you see the narrator as a grown woman, um, it's told with a, like hopefully a sense of, of immediacy and, and, mm. and a respect for that teenage experience as opposed to with a nostalgic mm. wisdom or uh, I think that's one of the things that's, that tends to separate YA as a genre from adult fiction about teenage characters, right? Mm -hmm. Is adult fiction about teenage characters has room to be jaded, has room to be cynical, has room to make fun of them, has room to know better than them or be wise about mistakes that those teenagers' characters are making. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff, um, including nostalgia, right, mm -hmm. that might in, uh, come into um, adult fiction. And I think that in YA, you very rarely see nostalgia. I mean, the, yes, Family of Liars does have it, but I think that it's still YA because it doesn't have all that other stuff that I just said. Mm -mm -mm. That makes sense. But sure, I, I mean, if there's a pop of nostalgia for those adult <laughs> readers, like that's a, you know, that can be very pleasurable. And I, I certainly hope people enjoy it. Mm. What draws you to writing young adult? Well, partly I just turn out to be good at it. Um, I didn't know that I would be. I had written two books for adults early in my career and neither of them was particularly successful. I wrote a book of essays and a novel. And I was struggling with my third novel 
um, or my, sorry, my third book for adults. Mm. And it was not coming together. And my editor ended up quitting the publishing house and leaving publishing. So I didn't even have anybody really to show it to Mm. besides my agent. And I just was at a loss. And I said to my agent, I was teaching three different, I had three different teaching gigs, right? You know, I was running all over New York City teaching. And I just thought I should be writing. I said, get me a job writing anything instead of teaching. Not that teaching is bad or that I didn't like it. I did like it, but I wasn't going to grow as a writer if I wasn't writing as a big part of my occupation. And this book, you know, needed to go in the garbage that I was working on. So I was like, let me ghost write. Let me, I'll, I'll write Nancy Drew novels or, or, you know, or, or, or movie tie-ins for somebody, or I'll write, I'll help, ghost write a cookbook or a self-help book. Like I'll, you know, I'm open to anything. I just want to be writing and getting better at it while I try to figure out a novel to write. And she said, okay, okay. I will put my ear, you know, I will put my, what's the phrase? My ear, ear to, the, to ground. the ground. <laughs> I'm a professional writer. She, she put her ear to the ground and um, she came back like two weeks later and she said, there's an editor at Random House who um, read your adult novel. She's like one of five people in the whole world who read this book, right? And it happened to be this editor at Random House who was publishing teen books and they were looking for, um, you know, what used to be called chiclet, like for, but for teenagers. And there was some really great stuff out there at that time. Um, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, mm-hmm. books by Louise Renison, uh, books by Meg Cabot, books by Rachel Cohn. Um, I went to the bookstore and I got all of these uh, in a big stack and I read them and they were so witty and funny and feminist and charming. And I thought, these are some really excellent books. This is some fun, smart, thoughtful fiction. And so I wrote a proposal and I got a two book deal. And I never had a two book (laughs) deal before. I'd just been at sea and messing around. And suddenly this publishing house was like, let's do it, let's go. And um, so I did, and the book I wrote was so obviously better than what I had written before. It was like very clear to me even early on, even before all the revisions I did, this was a book called The Boyfriend List. I just was obviously like more at home with this kind of character, with this length of story. I I was able to be like fresh and honest and my sense of humor was coming out better. And I think it was just better storytelling, more true, more open, looser. Um, And so, that was that, you know what I mean? Then I was a young adult novelist. Um, but the community is great, right? The people who make the books for young people, like those are great people. They are librarians, the booksellers, the English teachers, right? The, the other authors, like all these people, there are so many issues that you can get really excited about and, and be useful around when you're talking about books for young people issues about, for example, literacy, um, book banning, access to uh, libraries and, and, and books, um, inf- access to information about LGBTQIA issues or sexual health, um, freedom of speech. There's all kinds of needs, right, that young people as a group of readers have. But, you know, the crime readers, <laughs> We don't need to worry about them. They're fine. Crime <laughs> readers or, 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 you know, romance readers, they, they're grown ups. They don't have these same sets of needs around which a community can galvanize, right? We're not worried about the romance readers um, and the crime readers. They're, they're just independent. So the teenagers are not, right? Um, they need advocates, they need literature, they need access and all of this stuff. So I really liked that world that I found myself in with, with, with like colleagues who were doing things and useful things to do and fundraising and, and, and all of that. I really like it. So it's, Mm. 
um, it's been a great space and community as well as just a natural home for my voice. So you found your calling. You also had time working with DC Comics and and was given the opportunity to invent a superhero. I'm sorry, but that's like so many people's dream come true. How in the world did this happen? It was my dream come true too. Um, So I invented a superhero. I, I didn't know. I don't know if Whistle is available in Australia, but I invented a hero whose name is Whistle. And the the graphic novel is called Whistle, A New Gotham City Hero. So it's set in Gotham City, which, as you you know, is where Batman lives. And um, basically, I think that there's a was a really wonderful editor at DC Comics who was interested in bringing young adult novelists in to write comics for young people or, or graphic novels for young people using you know the dcu that existed famous characters gotham city and so on and um i think that she had read this novel of mine genuine fraud and genuine fraud has in it a lot of stuff about action heroes and superheroes in particular a lot of like coded references you know that a fan would recognize that somebody else might just skip over um but it's very much threaded through. And so I think they got interested in me because of that. That book has a lot of action. It's about a a con artist. Um, And they invited me to pitch them some characters. I pitched them two characters. And in both cases, they said no. Um, And I think this is always interesting for, for writers, like the people who listen to your podcast to hear because it was a definite no. It was like, mm, try again. And then <laughs> mm, not this one and not even try again. So I was like, all right, they don't like my proposals. Like it was nice to be invited to pitch. We're not a good fit. I was like, I forgot about it. But then I was going out to LA, which is where their offices are. And I was going to be out there for a little bit. And my agent said, that she had continued to talk to that editor, right? Mm-hmm. Who had had this idea of bringing in all these writers and they were bringing in really great people. They were bringing in, you know, they brought in uh, uh, Lauren Myrickle and Maggie Steve Otter and, and Mariko Tamaki and um, uh, Jean Lewin Yang and and just like really great people were, were writing their heroes. And um, Anyway, so my agent was like, oh, go go in and talk to them face to face, right? Stop Mm. talking to them on the telephone and via Mm. email. Just go in and talk to them. And I was like, okay, but they don't really like my writing. So I don't (laughs) think it's going to go that well, you know? Uh, But she was like, just go, go, go. I'm setting up the meeting. So I went and it's so fun there. Like if you were a comic, I grew up with Batman and (laughs) Spider-Man and Spider-Man's Marvel, of course, but I grew up with, you know, superhero comics as well as Archie comics and a lot of other stuff. So you walk in and there's like Henry Cavill's Superman suit (laughs) and and Ben Affleck's Batman suit or just, or maybe it's George Clooney. I'm not sure whose Batman suit it is, but it's Mm -hmm. like a Batman suit from the movies. And there's a whole like section of the, of the, um, lobby that has done like a sort of joker's lair and oh, wow. um and then they gave me a tour of the archive and like i have a phd in book history like i love a rare book room like i don't do that anymore but i was so excited to get in this archive and it there's like a librarian there's like an official dc comics librarian and he gives you a tour and he shows you all this movie memorabilia and and, and first editions and, and original art from like, you know, Wonder Woman one and things like that. You know, it's really, and you, I just thought this is Wonder Woman and Batman and Superman. Like these are characters that mean things to people yeah. all over the globe. And, and like, I'm looking at the first drawings of Wonder Woman, wow. right? And, and, you know, these characters have been around since the thirties, a lot of them. Right. So it's, 
just so much history and so much reach, right, for this storytelling. Yeah. So suddenly I wanted to be in the DC Comics business, which <laughs> I, you know, before I got there, I was like, rah, 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 rah. And I went and I thought, oh, they're going to tell me to like write them another pitch and they're not going to like it. But I at least was excited to be at the at the meeting by this point. And then they said, do you want to invite your invent your own superhero? And if you'd like to put her in Gotham, you can. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I thought you didn't even really like me. <laughs> and they were just like, well, we think you're not so good at pitching our characters, but we think you could make your own. And I was like, I would love to do that. And so that was it, really. I, I had so much fun. It was just a blast. Well, and I got to incredible. use Batman villains. So my, my book has the Riddler and Poison Ivy and Killer Croc in it. And it was just so fun to play in that sandbox. Absolutely incredible. How fantastic. Now, when you are in the throes of writing, you're in the depths of your first draft, let's just mm -hmm. take Family of Lies as an example because it's the one sure. that's, you know, out now. Do you have a writing routine that you get into? Like, do you have a process in that some authors, oh, they think about it for three months and then they start writing or they they don't know what's going to happen, then they discover it as they unfold. What do you do to the actual process of getting the words down? Well, I usually sell on a pitch. Mm. So with Family of Liars, I figured out the most important thematic content and, um, and the key elements of the plot. And I wrote a pitch um, and I write a very stylized pitch usually kind of it, as much in the voice of the book mm. itself as I possibly can. Um, and that's always the only way that it's worked for me. I can't kind of step back and coolly observe some novel that I haven't even written yet. I have to like really try to find the storytelling voice in the pitch. Mm. So I did that. It's maybe a 10 page pitch. And then I was contracted to write the book. And so I knew what those like tent pole poles are going to be, right? The things yep. that are going to hold up the plot. And I work in Scrivener, um, huh. which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm. It's a word processing program that allows you to kind of have a bird's eye view of the structure of your novel. Um, and you can see it a number of different ways. You can kind of see it as a big list um, or you can see it as uh, index cards mm. and um so i plugged my plot points into that and began generating more kind of things that would need to happen in order for those tent pole moments to happen right mm. oh well if this big thing is going to happen well then these people have to show up on the island and then these people have to you know then some the relationships have to develop in this way and i want there to be a lot of parties on this island so what kind of parties could i have and i spent some time brainstorming parties and i had a list of parties and some of them didn't make it into the book but i threw the parties in you know sometimes they just throw the parties into the outline somewhere being like eh, at some point we're going to need another party let's put a party <laughs> and I think, what happens at the party right so then i would say Maybe this happens at the party. Maybe that happens. Oh, I know this party should go earlier. So Scrivener lets you move those parties yeah. around and move the kissing scenes around and move, you know, move stuff around until you have. So then I'm writing little bits and pieces, but mostly I'm really just outlining. And then at some point I start really writing and I don't necessarily hold to that outline perfectly. It keeps moving but I can see the structure in Scrivener and being able to see the structure and see how I'm actually building suspense and how I'm building a romantic relationship in a story, you know, cause I can see what scenes are doing that, those jobs. Mm. And that um, really helps me to pace it properly. So you start with outlining, do you outline it till the end? So you know, basically the plot before you fill in the gap, so to speak. Uh, I mean, like I know that plot twists, mm -hmm. yes. Key elements, yes. But I don't know. I, I, I certainly didn't know like how the denouement was going to, sure. you know, pan out or really what I would have to say because I don't know what I'm going to say until I've written the rest of the novel, you know, and yes, I figured out like what it, what the journey really is. And then when so you. Said, the outline kind of says denouement. 
you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then when you're writing it, do you then, after you've outlined it to as much as you want to, do you then write it in a linear fashion or do you go, oh, you know, I might write this party today or I might write that, this kissing scene today. Or I might, and then yeah. just kind of fill it in depending on what you feel like. Um, I do bounce around. But I usually mm. write the opening of the book first, I, like the first 25, 30 pages mm. I write first because I'm making my way in yes. and I need to write in order to know the answers, right? And in yep. order to know who these characters are and and understand the world and, you know, <laughs> what the main character is up against in terms of the story world and the pressures the story world is putting on that main character. Mm. All that happens in those opening pages. So it's mm. not easy to jump forward to kissing when you don't know, <laughs> who is, you know? Yes, yes. And so when, in terms of your writing day, what does that look like? Because it's, I, I'm I'm amazed at how different different authors work, you know, from the hours they keep to the word count goals that they have to mm-hmm. what gets them into the groove. What does your writing day look like? Um, it's so boring. It's just <laughs> like, you know, I'm a parent, so I wake up in the morning and I do parenty stuff and I do houseworky stuff and I do some exercisey stuff and then I have some coffee and I take a shower. And then, you know, at kind of working hours when people have gone off to school and work and whatever, then I sit down and I open my computer and I try to write something. And I try to write, you know, I try to prioritize that and not get distracted by my email or a q and I have to do or, you know, art I have to review. It's very easy to like say, oh, I, mm. I just have to review this art because somebody wants an email back from me. Mm. It's better to say, no, I'm doing this book for like, you know, two, three hours. I usually have a word count goal. What is your word count goal? Um, at the start of a book, it's 500 words. A day. They're, yeah, which is small yeah um because i cannot do anymore when i don't know i don't have any momentum yet um and then if i'm if things are going really well i'll do you know 1500 to 2000 in a day okay but the 2000 word day is like i'm tuckered out after that Mm -mm. uh but yes at top speed i will go maybe 1500 words a day or you know a thousand to 1500 in a day depending on what else is going on you know yes um so do you have an end point in your day because some writers like to review what they've written in the day in the evening and you know do you have an end point or do you you close the computer and go that's it and i'm not going to think about it till tomorrow uh mostly i don't think about it i mean i do a lot of revision as i go um so i'm not necessarily generating 1500 words straight out i'm generating 400 going back you know then going Mm. back earlier you know flushing Mm. out a scene earlier on then going back to the main thing i'm working on revising that first 400 again okay now that's solid now i can go forward Mm. you know i do a lot of that so when you spoke about your experience with dc comics you spoke with such excitement and passion that and it was obviously a highlight in your professional career or, or something you really enjoyed doing. What else in your career as a writer has given you that buzz? Well, I really like collaborating, but I am, I, but only with the people I like collaborating with. You know what I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm not like a great team player. I never played softball or soccer or anything. I, I don't really have that great, uh, uh, you know, team spirit. But uh, I wrote a bunch of books for younger children together with Sarah Monofsky and Lauren Miracle called Upside Down Magic. And we did eight of them. And they were, it was so much fun. I mean, just to, their comedies. So I was writing, you know, these big, dark, young adult novels. And then, you know, when I was done with that for the day, I would get to just like try to make these two other writers laugh. And they're two of the funniest comedy writers I know and vice versa, right? So sometimes we would work all together on the phone, working on a Google doc. Other times we would send each other chapters back and forth, but it was so 
energizing. And I think that's one of the reasons that the DC project was also so fun is I had a huge amount of back and forth with the mm. artist Manuel Cretano. And, you know, we invented like a superhero costume together, right? Emailing back and forth, looking at inspiration images. And, you know, he was really flexible and would draw um, whatever I wanted him to draw, basically. And so that was, you know, and he was all the way in Italy and I've never met him. Wow. So we had this wonderful collaboration. Like he's my favorite person that I've never met. We've never even Zoomed. <laughs> wow. Know? I know. <laughs> in this day and age, how's that even possible? <laughs> no, we didn't. So um, I like I like the I like collaboration when it's when it's a good fit, and I've been mm. very lucky to have some some good fits that way. And and I think it makes me a stronger writer, right? To see have people push, you know, push against my ideas, um, rewrite something I've written, or or take an idea and run, you know, way further than I might have gone. Mm -mm. In terms of this book, what do you, what was the most enjoyable thing about it and what was the most challenging thing about writing it? Well, Family of Liars and We Were Liars are both set on this private island off the coast of Massachusetts, and it's got four houses on it. It's called Beachwood Island. And I just made it up. I've never been to a private island. I've, you know, looked at them <laughs> on the internet just like anybody. Um, but I spent a lot of time um, on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off of Cape Cod. And so I know that kind of landscape. So this island to me, it's like a, it was really nice to return to this island and to like mm. revisit, to go back into its past, to see the houses that used to be there, to invent those houses. To, but also to, you know, I think one of the pleasures of reading these books is is this great summer vacation, right? Mm. <laughs> With, um, you know, bad things happen. But mm. uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, craggy, windswept island with these, you know, old kind of Cape Cod style houses on it. And there's um, people are making beautiful food and having these sort of quirky summer parties. And so returning to Beachwood Island, I guess, was was a great pleasure for me. Mm. You know, I didn't think I was going to go back there and I got to go back there yes. um, in my imagination. Yes. Um, the challenge was that in writing a prequel or any kind of companion novel to a book that was known for it, two things, right? We Were Liars was known for making people cry mm -hmm. and for having a big plot twist. Mm -hmm. And so those are tall orders to be like, <laughs> okay, now your new book has to have a big plot twist and make people cry. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, if you say that to a novelist, they just kind of, they're going to crawl into a hole and, and not write anything. It's too scary. It's too hard to just like decide that that's your job. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I try to like break it down into much more small and nuanced um, kind of cognitive effects or pleasures that we were liars had delivered. Like what were elements that I could repeat but change or deepen or shift, right? And mm. I began sort of bit by bit to like find my way in to a way of delivering the same but still very different reading experience. Mm. And I had to do that in like in baby steps, I guess, in, in tiny gestures, in tiny choices. Um, in like bit by bit layering things um, into Family of Liars. Um, mm. There was no way for me to just do that all at once. No. It was too intimidating. Incredible. Obviously you succeeded. Um, and uh, so finally, what uh, I always end with, what are your top three um, tips for aspiring writers who would love to be in a position where, where you are one day with, you know, such incredible success Well, when I was in college, 
I took a creative writing class and I had never taken a creative writing class before uh, in college. I had taken one in high school and um, you had to submit a short story to get into this creative writing class. And I, I wrote a story just for that purpose. It had to be 10 pages long. I remember thinking, oh my God, how does anybody write a 10 page story? It seems so <laughs> long. Um, I got into the class. I was super proud and excited and it was such a disaster. Everybody in that class was really encouraged to just say vicious things about each other's work. So whenever my oh. pieces were workshopped, I would go home crying. And um, a lot of things were wrong in that class. But really what I was going to say was many, many people in that class were better writers than I was. I ended up feeling like I was the loser of the class, basically, and lots of them were very skilled and or talented. But I am the person, right, with the fiction writing career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what is the difference between me and them when I was like the worst student in the class? <laughs> and the difference between me and them is that my novels are finished. Mm. And they could be as brilliant as they were and probably still are. But if their novels are not finished, their novels are not going to be in a bookstore. Mm. So I wrote a novel and it was terrible. And I wrote another novel and it was terrible. And I set out to try to figure out how to write a good novel. And I educated myself to the best of my ability by taking apart the novels of Charles Dickens and the novels of Catherine Dunn and, you know, and saying and the novels of... Um, Oh, why can't I, John Irving and who, you know, these were just people I liked reading at the time, but, um, so one, finish your novel. Yes. Two, you can teach yourself to write a novel by taking books that you really like and trying to unpack what those people are doing, because there are a million guidelines and rules for writing fiction, but only you really love this one book right that really gets you and so you want to write like that person but like yourself right so what mm. is that person doing like how are they struck what you know what how are they structuring a scene how are they introducing a character how are they dealing with their exposition what are they doing that's building suspense are they you know john irving is naked with it he's absolutely <laughs> bald he says like little did i know like that all that was going to go to shit later right he's like absolutely telling you like a bad thing will happen later, so have some suspense right now. You know, it never <laughs> occurred to me that you were allowed to do that, right? He does it, and everyone loves it because, in certain, you know, in 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 strong hands, it works really well, mm. right? So you have to figure out how to. Okay, so how does he get away with it, right? How does he do it when it and it doesn't feel cheesy? What's you know wh what? How is he setting it up? And then he's you know, and then he's using it so that that you even in a calm part of the story, right? You want to move forward to find out what the drama is going to be. So take apart the thing that you really groove on, the thing that you, the book, that book that you want to read and reread um, and dissect it and unpack it and, and then borrow those techniques. Mm, um, love it. So that was two. <laughs> that was two. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Just have a thick skin. You're going to get rejected a lot. Mm. I, I mean, I, I have books in the past year, I've had multiple projects rejected, multiple pitches, multiple, uh, one full, you know, full length book that took several different editors to find a home for like, you know, I'm on the bestseller list right now and I'm still getting projects re rejected. So it's not going to, that's not going to be over probably ever. And so mm. you just have to be like, okay, didn't get what I want. What yes. now? And that, that attitude, okay, didn't get what I want, what now, mm. is, that's probably the other difference between me and those wonderful writers I was in college with, um, you know, is just that pick yourself up, dust yourself off, don't let the rejection get to you. 
Great advice. And no doubt you're going to consolidate yourself on the bestseller list with this. So family of liars, congratulations. <laughs> so excited. I'm excited um, for people to read it. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. So thank you so much for your time today, Emily. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to get to talk about writing.